Hello, this is Deborah. I just wanted to say a few words about the devastating displays of white supremacy that have gone on in the United States of America in the last couple of weeks and the attendant protests and how much we are in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. This episode, which we recorded in Australia in February this year, is particularly relevant because it reminds us that white supremacy is certainly not just something that happens in the United States. We have an incredible guest uh, who tells us about the situation in Australia for Indigenous people and how we can help. We encourage you to donate to the places that Eugenia suggests, but also to support the legal costs of those protesting in America right now. Uh, you can find the details of all of those things on our socials. And now, on with the episode. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on whose unceded land we are meeting today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their continued fight for sovereignty and self-determination and acknowledge that as settlers we have and continue to benefit from the theft of their land, culture and lives. I acknowledge that treaty talks in Victoria have not begun and pay my respect to elders past and any in the room here with us today. I'm a feminist, but when flying from Sydney to Melbourne to do this show, I looked around on the plane when I got on and said, is every flight attendant on this plane a man? Because, what? And then I went, oh no, there's a woman in charge, it's fine. <laughs> Wait, um, just before I do mine, mm. I just want everyone to know that we don't know, we didn't plan this. But <laughs> I'm a feminist, <laughs> but this morning when I flew from Sydney to Melbourne... <laughs> what? We don't tell each other our I'm a feminist parts. That's amazing. Yeah, I flew from Sydney to Melbourne this morning. Um, thanks. <laughs> and I used my uh, good looks to get a better seat on the plane. And by good looks, I mean hungover looks. And I think the lady at the check-in felt sorry for me. And she said, have you got a good seat? And I went, um, yeah, and she goes, let me see what I can do for you. Let me see what, and I've nothing, I didn't ask for it or anything. She went, there's an exit row if you'd like that. And I went, no, 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 that's fine. She went, you want more, more leg room? I'm like, no. I said, it's good where I am because at the moment, there's no one sitting next to me at the moment. She goes, I'll block that out. I'll do a courtesy block for you. <gasps> wow. Were you flirting with her? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I think she just felt sorry for me. Because you were hungover? Yeah. Did she, is she a fan of your comedy? I don't know. <laughs> She didn't say, oh, you're Geraldine Hickey, I'm a big no. fan of your comedy, let me block out all the rows around you so you can just no, she travel just in luxury. she just looked at me and went, you need a good seat. <laughs> it was great. I'm a feminist, but I would rather pay money to someone else to come and finish our renovations than let my partner do it. <laughs> She's very good, but... She's also very busy, and we don't have a kitchen still. <laughs> <laughs> and it's almost finished. It's just, it's been nearly a year. <laughs> and she, but she, I'm very thankful for all the hard work that she does. Does she listen to this show? Will she listen to this episode if you do it? Well, let's find out. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, she does, and, uh, but I did... I will mention it to her. It's probably good that you do. When I get home. It's probably good that you do, yeah. I'm a feminist, but sometimes I enjoy watching a catastrophic trip up in a ball gown during awards season. If the gown is particularly ludicrous, and especially if I do not know or like the celebrity involved. <laughs> you know, sometimes... It's yeah. like a, they're wearing such a ridiculous gown to the Oscars or the Golden Globes, yes. they trip up a bit. Yes. Either on the red carpet or on their way to the stage. There's a mishap. So that time that Madonna was walking up the stairs 
and somebody stood on her train oh. and she fell backwards. That was an unfunny version of it because yeah. obviously we were all worried for Madonna. Mm -hmm. Because if Madonna dies, what's left? <laughs> <laughs> she can't. She, I just feel it's going to age us all if Madonna dies. You know, we're all going to be like, now even Madonna's gone. You know, like she has to hold on. When Madonna stops reinventing herself, then that's when the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Right. You know, and there's already been three, so I don't want the fourth one to... If but you say Madonna is one of the horses of the apocalypse? <laughs> yes. Of course not. All the horses oh. of the apocalypse are men. Yeah. <laughs> there's very few female characters in the Bible, and the ones that are there generally don't end well. Yeah. Mm. Have you got another one? Yes. Um, I'm a feminist, but um, once I threw an egg at a girl and told her it would be good for her, her hair... <laughs> I don't think that needs any more explanation. <laughs> Live from the Thornbury Theatre in Melbourne, the Sponsor Air Shop presents The Guilty Feminists with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Geraldine Hickey and very special guest Eugenia Flynn talking about opportunity. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. <laughs> I'm Deborah Francis White, this is Geraldine Hickey, and we're talking about opportunity. <laughs> Hello, Geraldine. Sup, fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Deborah. Have you, you look tired. Have you had a long day smashing the patriarchy? I did. And I'm um, just napping on the couch um, in between smashes. <laughs> just smash, little lie down, and, and another smash. It's important to rest. Self care between yeah, patriarchy between and smashing. Between smash patriarchy. Mm. I'm noticing there, in fact, there's a smash the patriarchy t shirt in the front row. Oh, oh, it says, what does it say? <laughs> smash the lemon lizard. No, patriarchy. demon lizard. Oh, smash the demon lizard patriarchy. I like lizards. <laughs> I've not fully understood what that means. <laughs> What's that? Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, Buffy the Vampire oh. It's a Buffy reference. I've revealed myself as not a true feminist now. Yes. <laughs> Because I do not know all the Buffy references. I, Buffy sort of passed me by. I'll tell you why. I misunderstood Buffy, and I thought, oh, it's just a show for, you know, people who want to watch hot blonde yes. girls kicking their legs in the air. Yeah. <laughs> just hot. <laughs> Could you explain it in more depth, Geraldine? Like, the nuances of it? Because I believe... I should have there was a lot of uh, layers to it in terms of archaic storytelling and power struggles. Excuse me, I'm so sorry yes. to reach across you, but I just realised that that bottle was masking oh, the audience's yes. view of my face, and they won't want that. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. No, Buffy was hot, <laughs> and she. I don't um, think that's what you're meant to say. Oh, it's what's the nuances though? Wasn't there nuances? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Can I just ask the feminist in the front row with the smash the lizard patriarchy? In fact, are you knitting during the show? No, 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 no. Excuse me, that is quilting. <laughs> is it? What are you doing? You're making a beanie. Oh. You're crocheting. Knitting, oh. knitting. No, she was it knitting. is knitting, sorry. I don't know. I feel like I'm the more observant person, but you're the better feminist for not being able to identify knitting. Yeah. <laughs> close range. Oh. I don't know now. But then there's nothing unfeminist about knitting. Yeah, it's I'm... just that we've got these values in our head about crafting. They imply domesticity and some reason that's meant to be bad because... I've just got bad eyesight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see that. But I just, I just think we do sometimes project oh, knitting, not feminist. But of course, knitting is a wonderful craft. Yes. And actually, it's not that we need fewer women to knit. We need more men to knit. Because if they were... Occupied, they couldn't be dropping so many bombs. Yeah. And I just feel like, say they'd given George Bush and all the people that worked for him mm -hmm. just 
got him into this. It's just your hands are occupied. Yes. And it helps you focus. Mm. And I think it's a calming thing. It's like yoga that you can do at a theatre. I totally agree. <laughs> Which I, like I, I appreciate. It's calming me, to be honest. You'd yeah. think, you, you, you might think it's distracting, but it's not. It's not. No. <laughs> that was probably a concern of yours when you came and thought, I'll knit. But don't, genuinely. It sounds like I'm being sarcastic now, and I'm really... <laughs> I'm not. I, I'm finding it. Is anyone else brought a craft? Yes. yes. What, what have you bought? Brought, you've brought embroidery. Oh. That's. I mean, the crossover between my demographic and Jane Austen's is quite the significant. The Venn diagram is a circle. It's. It's what I'm saying. It's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. Listen, welcome to you and whatever art craft form you brought. <laughs> it's going to be an industrial... I'll tell you, when we could have a sale out there at the end. So, so, all the, be, the beanies baby? of fiver, you know, embroidered... You've, are you cross-stitching? It's a journal jacket. Do you know what? I think you're very wise, because when you get tattoos, you can't have them removed. <laughs> But a journal jacket, you embroider on a word, and if ten years later you go, that word's silly, just unpick it. <laughs> hmm? Burn it, did you say? Oh, well, that's extreme, but, you know. Yeah. We do have quite a radical audience. It's a, there's a crossover, a crossover between pragmatists and radical people that come. I'm clearly a pragmatist because I say things like, don't get a tattoo, embroider your jacket. <laughs> In that way, I'm much like your mum, yeah. who would give you the same advice. Have you got any tats? I do, actually. Is that a rude question? No, no, not at all. I have a tattoo. I went to a tattoo expo once because I got free tickets. <laughs> because I, I interviewed a tattoo artist on the radio show that I do, mm. and he had a good time, and he said, you guys were fun. Would you like some tickets to the tattoo expo? Mm -hmm. And I went, yeah. Yeah, it'd be churlish not to. Yeah. And um, no one wanted to go with me, but I went on my own. Because um, I thought, oh, I might see some fun stuff. I don't know what, but... <laughs> so I'm always looking for things to talk about on the radio. So I went and uh, I did say to my friend, I uh, said, do you want to come? Because he's got tattoos. And he's like, nah. And he goes, you know what it is? And I'm like, yeah, it's a tattoo expo. And he goes, it's just rows upon rows of people getting tattoos. And I'm like, great. He goes, you're not going to get one. I'm like, absolutely not. I have no intentions of getting a tattoo at all. And then I've got a tattoo. Um, I think, see, this is how cults work. You get in, everyone else is doing it. Yeah. You can't find the exit. You, somehow. I mean, you... Do you know what I was? I, was I, I went in and then I came and got and I, I saw someone that I knew. I'm like, oh, I know you. And she was the tattoo. I didn't know that she did tattoos and she was doing one and I was just happened to be flipping through her book and I went, oh, that's cool. And she went, do you want it? And I went, yep. <laughs> and, then, and then she said, come back in an hour. And I went, okay. And then she said, do you want the actual size? I went, yeah. It was... <laughs> like, in the book, it was that big and I thought it was going to be that big. Okay, if you're listening at home... Oh, like the size of a... Two hands next yeah, to each other. Like a big phone, or, yeah, that... <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe the head... Oh, I thought it'd go across the, the back of my calf muscle. Oh, that's where I thought... Because I, like, I wanted it on the back of my leg because I didn't have to look at it all the time. <laughs> I think that's... In, if I get a tattoo, I don't want to look at it. And be... Anyway, do you want to see it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Wow. Okay, if you're listening at home, if you're listening at home, it's, it's a tattoo of a whale that really spans the full ankle to knee on yeah. the side of the It goes all the, yeah, all the way down, and it's a um, sperm whale. <laughs> Ironically. Yeah. Not often you see sperm down a Lezo's leg, but... <laughs> but the, 
um, <laughs> the sperm whale has the biggest brain of all the mammals, so that's why I got it. <laughs> the biggest brain of all the mammals? Yeah. Why aren't they head of the food chain then? I think they're up there. <laughs> but we, we, mean, are. we, yeah, we, we are. We are, clearly. Yeah. Because we run the world. If sperm whales ran the world, we wouldn't have any problems with the environment at all. They're not making straws and throwing them into the ocean. No, because they know better. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Bigger brains. Bigger brains. <laughs> Are you ready to hear some sound comedy? Yeah. Then please welcome to the stage the excellent Geraldine Hickey. Yeah. Hello. I am um, uh, uh, growing up. We I was in a family with there were six kids, so our family holidays were pretty limited in what we did. Um, so now that I'm older and I have no children, I like to go on the type of holidays that all the rich kids at school went on when I was at school. <laughs> so if I get the opportunity to do something like swimming with dolphins, I will do it. Right? <laughs> Um, because I love an adventure. Um, someone called me a lazy adventurer, though. Um, I'm not lazy. I just know where my strengths are. <laughs> and it's not in planning or tying ropes or harnesses. <laughs> Last year, I had uh, the opportunity... I went to the Waitomo Caves, the glowworm caves in New Zealand. <laughs> so good. Maybe a few people have been. Yep. When you went through, like, did you walk through or in a boat or you walked? Cool. <laughs> it's beautiful, yeah. And on a boat as well. I went um, blackwater rafting. I know, it sounds that's sick. I was like, yeah, that's what I want, adventure, blackwater rafting, woo! And I was reading the reviews and one of the reviews of this trip said, um, actually, this is pretty tame. I was really disappointed. This wasn't exciting at all. And my partner read it as well. And she went, oh, it's so annoying when people write these reviews and they've got no idea what they're talking about. And I went, what are you, what? And she went, it's black water rafting. I went, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Woo. And she went, N no. It's called, think about it, white water rafting is called that because the water's all churned up and it makes it go white. <laughs> Black water rafting is just, the water's still, yeah? <laughs> and I went, oh, so it's floating. <laughs> she went, yes, and I went, but, in the dark, yeah. Um, so you just get a tube, you get a big tube, and then you can sit in the tube, and they said, just get a big one, because it's more comfortable. It's more comfy in the big tube. No, um, like a bigger tube just meant like a bigger hole. And I just, like I just wanted to like sit normal in the tube and float around, except I'd sink into it and be like that for a bit and then go, oh, I'll just, I'll just sit up a bit and then I'll just be like that. And I just wanted to be like that. But that or that were my only options. But then at one stage I saw what the tour guides, like early, I remembered that they weren't even in their tubes. They were just kind of walking through the river. They're just walking through and going, look at the glowworms, there they are. And I went, I'll just do that. I'll just get out and walk. It'll be fine. But the water was very deep, and, um, and I was up the back, and I just was like, oh, I've made a mistake here. Um, I should, I'll just try and get back in the tube. It's very difficult to get in a tube where the water's very deep, and you don't want anyone to know that you're kind of hanging out up the back and just trying to remain inconspicuous, and then... Someone caught me and, you know, I just heard this, oh, no, someone's fallen out of the tube. 
someone, let me help you back into your tube. Don't, everybody, don't worry if you, if you fall out of your tube. Don't be embarrassed to tell us if you've fallen out of your tube. We can come and help you. Look, I'm not embarrassed. I'm just, well, I am. Um, just don't want to tell you that I got out deliberately. Um, I, um, I also uh, um, had the opportunity to go zip lining in the Otways. Love it. Another adventure right there. Like I, there was one that was really long, and they said, this one's really long. It's the longest one that we've got. And so you, you go quite fast, but then we make it go up at the end so you don't smack into the tree. <laughs> like, that's good. Um, and then they said, uh, now, because it goes up a bit, some people don't make it to the end. <laughs> And my mind stepped in then and went, that's going to be you. (laughs) Like, have a look around. Look at everyone else. Have a look at yourself. You're not making it to the end. (laughs) And And then my mind goes, I wonder what you're supposed to do if you don't make it to the end. I said, well, let's find out. And then I tuned back in, just as the guide said, and that's what you do if you don't make it to the end. (laughs) All right. So, let's just hope for the best. So I got harnessed up, off I went. (sighs) Let go, maverick, right? You don't have to hold. I'm harnessed, right? And I'm looking up and looking down, it's great. And then I made it to the end. I got one foot on the end. And then I rolled back. <laughs> and then all of a sudden there was a rope in front of my face. And I'm like, I reckon you have to grab hold of that. I was right. Because um, someone said, grab hold of the rope. Um, so I grabbed hold of the rope. And then I was like, what? I'm thinking, I don't know what to do next. Turns out, didn't have to do anything. Because the woman on the other end of that rope just had to haul me in. Right? She's just on the other end, I'm holding on to it, and she's like, Ugh! and then there's just me, <laughs> just dangling over the Otways, <laughs> just like a fat toddler being picked up out of the car. <laughs> just. And I looked at it and I went, I'm so sorry. (laughs) I said, I don't know how to help you. (laughs) And she was like... (gasps) If you could just start walking. And I went, oh, yeah, I can do that, no problem. (laughs) Thanks very much, I've been your hickey. It's time to welcome a very good friend of mine, very funny lady, and you all love her, Deborah Francis White, everybody. So, when I was young, uh, I loved Paul McCartney, I loved the Beatles, really big into the Beatles. Anyone else a Beatles fan? <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm going to ask you this question now. Has anybody here been winked at or seen from the stage by a pop star or rock star? Has anyone had that experience where they've said, rock star's gone, yep, just give us a cheer if you think that's happened to you? The numbers do not stack up, gang. It's not possible. Nearly every woman and gay man I know believes themselves to have been personally clocked or acknowledged by a rock star or pop star member of a boy band or similar. It's not possible. I tell you what is happening. They are talented at doing a generic wink and making a thousand women slash gay men feel personally more sexually attractive. They throw a wink out knowing lots of people will receive that wink. Now, in my case, Paul McCartney really did wink at me (laughs) in the 90s in Sydney at a rock concert. That did actually happen to me. It did not happen to you. (laughs) 
but I know it did. I know it did. I got down the front. I broke past the security guards in an act of at sheer opportunism. And I saw a moment, and the security guards were stopping people, and I just went through. I'm not fast. I'm not agile. I'm not one of those people that can just get past things. But for some reason, on that day, I wanted it enough. I saw that moment. It was like the great escape. And I just went, there's my window. And I just didn't even think about it. I just ran past the security guard, got right down to the front. And Paul McCartney saw me and winked at me like this. Now, just put your hand up if you think I winked at you. How many people think I winked at them? Only two. Three. Okay, three, three. So I'm not a pop star or a rock star, and that's clear. So I can only make three women feel winked at at once. Anyway, I now live with a man who is a Syrian refugee who came to live with my husband and me. And in just over two years, we are like family. He is like a brother to me or an ersatz son, not to in any way infantilize him, but we are very close. We're very, very, very close family. And one of the joys of having Steve live with us, because Steve is, he's so articulate, Steve. His English is the kind of English where he knows the difference between infer and imply, and you're not really sure about that, are you? <laughs> His English is so good, it's the kind of English where when you say, oh my God, the amount of people in town, he'll go, isn't it number of people? Because amount is something like sand that you can't count, but number is individual items. I'm like, all right. <laughs> All right, you learn English. I didn't learn it. Well, I did, but I learned it randomly and organically. <laughs> yes, you're better at English than me. All right, all right. It's annoying. But one thing he doesn't know is music, because he wasn't allowed uh, to listen to music growing up, and there was an embargo in Syria or anywhere. They couldn't get a lot of stuff. And so he's constantly discovering songs, and he'll come out of his room and go, I have to play you this song. And then he'll go, it's amazing. I've listened to it six times. And then he'll put on every breath you take. I'll be like, Steve, this is a really famous song. It's so famous. It's one of those famous songs in the world. And he'll go, no, I've just discovered them. I need to share it with someone who doesn't know it. I'm like, there isn't anybody. And he'll be like, there must be some. I'm like, if you want to, you'll have to find someone under five. Because they might not have heard it, but everyone's like, no, I need to find another adult human because I need to share this experience. And I'm like, it's too late. It's been shared. <laughs> One day, I was talking to him about the Beatles, and he said, yes, I know the Beatles. And I referred to Hey Jude. He said, I've never heard that song. I said, you will have heard it. You, you, you can't not have heard it. It's the most famous song in the world. Uh, so, and he was like, I don't think I have. So I sang a bit for him. And he said, and it was like, I was like, sure. Na, 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 See, you all know it. There you go. And... Uh, he was like, no, I haven't. So I said, oh my God, I'm going to be the person that lets you hear Hey Jude for the first time. This is a magical moment. Everyone, be quiet, go away. So I put it up, got the speakers, you know, everything set up, played him the whole of Hey Jude just before it got to that Judy, 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 Judy bit, and somebody called me on the phone, and it interrupted. I know, it was devastating. We had to listen to the whole thing again. Now... It was not long later, anyway, he loved it, he loved it, and he listened to that five times and said, who can I share it with? And I said, nobody. <laughs> now, it wasn't long after that that a friend of the podcast invited me to her party, and she is a very well-known person uh, who has a lot of famous friends because she's been in the industry a long time, and she's very humanitarian as well. And, and so there were lots and lots of famous people there. And in walks, I'm not making this up, Paul McCartney. Now, the thing with Paul McCartney at a party is nobody really wants to talk to him because it's, even if you're famous, you're not as famous as Paul McCartney and no one wants to be like going up to the famous person. So he chatted to the host and he chatted to a few people he knew and then he was just standing there with his wife. Just, they were just chatting to each other and no one was really talking to them. And I was just getting to the bar. Obviously, I wasn't going to go over and go, oh, hello, Paul McCartney. So I was getting my drink at the bar and I turned around and I saw Steve chatting to him. And I was like, and the thing is, Steve doesn't have a great read on how famous people are because he's just like, oh yeah, there's one of the Great British Bake Off finalists. There's a Beatle. <laughs> the same, like for him, it's the same. Which, like, if we were in an Arabic country, we wouldn't know. If someone said that person's a celebrity and they're off the telly and that person's a, a film star, you wouldn't really have a read, you know, if you're out of your culture, if you're in Japan. So he was chatting away to Paul McCartney, the only one. 
because he wasn't quite sure how famous the Beatles were. So I thought, here is my moment, because I can slide over into their DMs and just sort of be like, oh, hi, I'm, you know, Steve and I live together, blah, blah, blah. So I went over, with because I had a drink for Steve as well, and that was helpful, because I had to give it to him. So I went over and gave Steve his drink and said, oh, Paul, I'm a big fan, my name's Deborah, and is Steve lives with us, he's from Syria. He said, yeah, he was just telling me, and he was just telling me about, he said, you know, amazing journey and everything. And I said, funnily enough, it was only last week, I, for the first time, played him Hey Jude, and it was a really big deal to you know, play that song for someone for the first time, because everyone knows it so well. And he said, you know, you read all this stuff about refugees. Whenever you meet them, they're so lovely. You know, the thing is, I would really love you to bring Steve to one of my concerts because that's when music, you can see music really brings people together. It doesn't matter who people are, where they're from. He said, when 50,000 people are singing Hey Jude together, that's when you feel the unity of music. And that's when hate dissipates and people come together. And I said, I'd love to do that, Paul McCartney. Um, <laughs> and in fact... I've been to one of your concerts before, and uh, <laughs> you winked at me. And he said, I remember you. <laughs> and I said, I know you don't, I know you just throw it out, and everyone feels winked at, and he went, no. And he took his hands in mine, and he went, I winked at you, and you've always got that. This was a big moment for me. <laughs> Do not ruin it! Do not ruin it! And as I went to walk away, because I thought, I'm going to end this, I want to be the one to end it, you know what I mean? I chatted to his wife, and like, it had been so lovely, and I thought, I don't want him to at some point start to creep away, you know, that feeling? So I was like, I'm professionally ending this, because this is perfect. So I said, I'm going to go to the bar and get another drink. He probably thinks I'm an alcoholic. And uh, <laughs> I said, I'm going to go to the bar and get another drink. Would anyone like one? And they said, no, we're fine. And I said, great. So Steve came with me and said, absolute pleasure to meet you. And just as I left, he went, I did wink at you, you know. And I was like, oh, my God, he's such a lovely man. Anyway, off I go. On the way to the bar, Steve just looked at me and he went, he's always talking about integration. He's always talking about, you know, ways he can integrate. You know, recently he said to me, I want to pay as much tax as possible in the United Kingdom. That's my goal, because the United Kingdom have taken me in. I said, don't say that down the Home Office. They really will think you haven't integrated at all. That's not <laughs> something a British person would say. Uh, um, and he's always sort of saying, is this integration? He was in the last episode of Fleabag. Uh, he played, do you remember when the godmother says, oh, these are my fascinating friends at the wedding. This is my friend, he's a bisexual Syrian refugee. Yeah, yeah. And he came back from that. And he said, Olivia Coleman touched me. Have I integrated? And I said, yes. I said, yes. She's played the queen twice and won an Oscar for being the queen, which is more than the queen's done. I said, that's, that's, yes, yes. So he's always saying, is this integration? He, he was a background artist in Bond. And he, he said, is that integration? Yes, yes. You've been in Bond. You've been in Fleabag. You've, you, yes, yes, these things are integration. And as we walked away from our exchange with Paul McCartney, he looked at me and said, do you think meeting Paul McCartney, is that full integration? <laughs> and I said, Steve, you've no idea the amount of people who've met Paul McCartney. And he said, isn't it number? <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello, Guilty Feminists. This week, we are doing a series of comedy events for Amnesty International. We have some recorded videos and live Q&As analysing the legacy of comedy for Amnesty. On Monday evening at 7.30pm, British Summertime, Juliet Stevenson and Siobhan McSweeney join me to answer your questions live after the video is released about the famous Monty Python for Yorkshire Men sketch, which for recent events we've turned into the for Yorkshire Women sketch. And Wednesday, a huge privilege, we reunite the cast of Goodness Gracious Me plus Nish Kumar uh, to talk about Going for an English, which was a classic sketch performed at an Amnesty International show at Wembley Arena, which we recreated in Edinburgh for Amnesty with Nish Kumar and some Guilty Feminist favourites, Sindhu V and Bisha K. Ali. 
So tune in to see everything they said in the reunion video, but also to answer your questions live Wednesday, 7.30 British Summer Time. That will be on Amnesty UK's Facebook page, but you can find all the details about those things and other celebrations of comedy with Amnesty that we're doing this week on our socials and Amnesty UK's socials. Our socials on Instagram are at The Guilty Feminist and at DF Dubs, and on Twitter at Guilt Fem Pod and at Deborah FW. This week, I did Mary Beard's Culture Lockdown Show, which is now on BBC iPlayer. And I also did Krishnan Guru Murthy's Channel 4 podcast, Ways to Change the World. Check out both of those every day at 6 p.m. British Summertime. I do The New Normal on Instagram Live at The Guilty Feminist with some incredible guests. And you can see the ones we've already done on Instagram television or YouTube. This week, we had both Siobhan McSweeney, who plays Sister Michael in Dairy Girls, and... Jamie Lee, who plays Michelle in Derry Girls, as well as Nikesh Shukla and lots of other brilliant people. So go and check those out uh, and tune in live this week. If you'd like me to make a video for you or for one of your friends for their birthday or a pep talk or anniversary, anything like that, please go to the Cameo app and find me. All of the proceeds go to Choose Love Help Refugees. And so far we've made about three grand for them. So we're very excited. Please keep it coming. Finally, my book is available and it's also available as an ebook or an audio book where I read it to you. So check that out. And if you'd like to support the podcast, please check out our Patreon until we can sell tickets for shows again. That's all the income we have and we still pay our guests and all of our costs. So we thank you so much to everyone who's doing it. It's making such a big difference. And if you can afford anything, we'd really, really appreciate it. And now back to the podcast. Our guest today is a writer, arts worker, and community organizer. As an Aboriginal, Chinese, and Muslim woman, Eugenia works within multiple communities to create change through literature, art, politics, and community engagement. Eugenia's thoughts on the politics of race, gender, and culture have been published widely, including in the recent anthology, Hashtag Me Too, Stories from the Australian Movement. Put your hands together and make incredible Melbourne guilty feminist woohooing noises for the wonderful Eugenia Flynn! <laughs> Eugenia, thank you so much. It's so lovely to have you. No worries. Uh, I was firstly, uh, when I came to Australia, I was uh, kept seeing on the news talk about closing the gap. And I obviously read about the story. And this is not an expression that I think will be globally understood. And we have a big global podcast audience who need to know more about this and need to know more about Indigenous people the world over. Could you explain, Eugenia, what closing the gap means in Australia? Sure. Um, so Close the Gap or Closing the Gap is a campaign that's about encouraging and holding government accountable for a set of targets that are to do with closing the gap of disadvantage between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people in this country. And those gaps are across a range of different indicators, predominantly health indicators. So the kind of big uh, statistic that always gets touted is the life expectancy gap, so that Indigenous people are more likely to die at an earlier age than their non-Indigenous counterparts. But there's a range of other indicators as well that are across different areas like uh, education, contact with the justice system, that kind of thing. And those disadvantages really come from the legacy of colonisation. And quite often what we hear in public discourse is that, that colonisation is something that happened over 200 years ago and that why are Indigenous people still complaining or still going on about this? And quite often the onus is put on Indigenous people that... Uh, they are victims, that they're always looking for a government handout and that they don't want to take responsibility for, um, you know, that it's their personal responsibility in regards to things like health statistics, the gap, for example. So this kind of campaign and the push to have government be responsible and accountable for achieving targets to close those gaps... You know, that really is about redressing those 
wrongs. And it's also, I think, very much about acknowledging that the systems and the institutions, if we think about Australia as a country that has institutions like the health system or the justice system or the education system, those institutions were set up for essentially the British that came here. And they don't work for Indigenous people who were historically excluded from those. The education system is a really, really good example of that because many Indigenous people were forbidden to go to school. Instead, they were trained as domestics or they weren't educated at all. They were educated to a certain level that they could then go on and work in service. And so, you know, when you have been historically excluded from the institution of education and then when you are allowed, you know, the education system uh, talks about how your people died out and you don't exist anymore or it says horrible things like that, you know, Indigenous women in traditional society ate their babies, which was a fabrication. But those sorts of... Um, things were in history books and were taught in schools. So when you have uh, that kind of history, it makes it really difficult for Indigenous people to value education, to have access to education. Quite often, a lot of Indigenous people live on the poverty line or you know, in third world conditions and therefore don't have access to education. So the campaign, Closing the Gap, really is about acknowledging that whole complexity. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for explaining that. It's... Yeah, 200 years is just not... It's just not very long ago. Like, it's two people's lifetimes, really, back, back to back, in order yeah. to think about the socioeconomic... Yeah, and there's lots of... Marginalisation oppression you inherit. And there's lots of different things. I mean, what people need to understand is that colonisation isn't something that just happens quickly and then ends and then you have a new society. It's something that continues on. And so, for example, things like the stolen generation, there are people who are alive who were still part of that um, process. And for your global listeners, the stolen generation was a, a set of policies that saw... Indigenous children taken from their parents and uh, maybe adopted out or placed onto missions and reserves, but forcibly removed from their parents just for the sin of being black. So those sorts of policies, they're not something that is very far away. Mm -hmm. For a lot of us, that's very present still. That was, some of that was in the 60s, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, and some of that, I mean, there are... Um, some people who would say that that continued up to the 70s and 80s as well. Wow. Yeah, that's really shocking. What really struck me was the piece that you wrote for the Me Too anthology, the Australian stories, and because that's where it looks at the intersection of Indigenous people and feminism... And I was wondering if you would read a bit for sure. our audience and our listeners. Yeah, um, so I kind of didn't want to read the whole thing because it's quite long. But I also just wanted to say that, you know, this was something that I wrote. You know, when we talk about the Me Too movement and I was approached to write something for this anthology, I think often we think about that as a confessional and I didn't want to, um, which is perfectly fine for lots of people who are survivors, they find comfort in the sharing of their story and the witnessing of that. But what I wanted to do was to provide a context to the history of this place and so um, that kind of idea of this place will sort of be a bit repeated through. Um, so I sort of took a bit from the beginning and the middle and the end. I write to tell you the story of this place, of the white patriarchy that permeates all of the institutions of Australia and therefore the society that these institutions hold up. I want you to know, to really know the history of this place, that there is nowhere on this continent that has been untouched by white patriarchal violence and that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women have suffered this violence standing side by side with our men. I want you to know that this place continues to be shaped by white patriarchy and that this hurts both you and me, that it takes aim at non-white migrants, refugees and asylum seekers, and that it damages both black and white Australia, 
although I refuse to tell a story that uses whiteness to navigate Indigenous humanity. I write to remind you that this place is forever shaped by the stories of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. Our lives, our losses, our suffering, our dignity and our resistance. But I will not tell the stories of this place in the voyeuristic ways expected of the marginalised. I will tell this story for my people who will understand the simplicity of the words for the complex narratives that they hold and who will continue to tell our stories whether you are listening or not. What is it about this place? For me, it is all the negative stereotypes about Aboriginal women that you can think of. Subservient to dominating and violent Aboriginal men, bad mothers, negligent mothers, mothers who eat their own babies, poor black women on welfare, drug abusers and alcoholics, violent women, ugly women, unfeminine yet free to be sexually exploited and denigrated women, sexually promiscuous women, women whose sexual misuse is eroticised, women who sully the white men who sleep with us. This place is the impact these stereotypes have on the way Aboriginal women are treated in the media and in the court of public opinion. It is the stereotyping of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women within the legal system. It is the way in which Aboriginal women's experiences of sexual assault and domestic violence are reported in the media. It is Aboriginal female victims reported by the media as promiscuous, drug and alcohol abusers, neglectful mothers and more. It is Aboriginal women who are unheard, misheard and not taken seriously by the legal system when they should be supported in the aftermath of a sexual assault or gendered violence. For me, this place is the power of black women speaking their truth as survivors of sexual assault, violence and abuse. It is all of the stories of black women never being taken seriously. It is the Me Too movement not hearing all the times that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women did not speak out for fear of further stereotyping our men. It is Indigenous women not wanting to report sexual harassment, assault, violence and abuse so as to protect their community from being attacked by racists. It is Aboriginal women still speaking out against Aboriginal male perpetrators, despite all the complexity in doing so. It is us still speaking out, despite being disparaged, harmed and dismissed by white police and authorities. Sometimes this place is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women standing beside their men, not as victims, but with the understanding that the legacies of trauma and dysfunction impact us all. It is Indigenous women prioritising collective community over individual rights. It is that space that so many Aboriginal women occupy, a space that exists between reporting, not reporting, and carrying out our own forms of justice. What really struck me when I read that was the point about if you are in a marginalised community, you cannot trust the authorities. There are times when you cannot afford to criminalise the men in your community, even though they're perpetrators, partly because the legacy of violence is partly about the colonisation and brutality. That's the inherited end of that story. But partly because you just don't trust the justice system and you don't trust white people coming in. Sure. And that system, we have to be really clear, has always been, you know, the, the state has always been incredibly violent towards Indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. And there's a really particular gendered violence about that. One of the statistics, if we're talking about closing the gap in terms of the justice system, is that Indigenous women are now being incarcerated at higher and higher rates. And a lot of the research that's coming out and anecdotal evidence as well is that you know, Indigenous women quite often will do things like there's a DV situation at home, they'll call the police, and then the police will end up 
putting them in prison for things like unpaid fines. So oh un unpaid fines is an issue within Indigenous communities. You might have a fine for driving an unregistered car because you live on the poverty line and you can't afford it, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, once those fines build up to a certain amount, then you're required to be arrested, that sort of thing. Those kinds of issues disproportionately impact Indigenous communities. But for Indigenous women, you know, we look at the case of a black death in custody in WA, Ms. Ju. She had actually, uh, before she was taken into custody for unpaid fines, she was reporting domestic violence. And for a lot of Indigenous women, that's increasingly being reported as to how they've ended up in prison is because mm. they had done a call out. And I think that that's a really good example of how uh, institutions are working against Indigenous people and that kind of level of state violence against Indigenous women. And, I, you know, also there's a lot of history of Indigenous women being abused, sexually abused by police officers mm. or witnessing violence towards family members uh, by police, there's a lot of mistrust. Mm. And I suppose because also so many Aboriginal men die in custody as well here and at deeply disproportionate rates, mm. and nobody should die in custody unless it's of natural causes, but if so many men are dying of brutality in jail, you, most of the time your abuser in a domestic violence case is somebody you love. It could be your father. And so although you are the victim in that case. I can see why you would have a hesitation to call the police and say, come and take him away. So that really struck me. So what can we do personally to help close the gap? Because the news is not, well, we're really making great progress on that gap closing. That doesn't seem to be the news. Sure. I mean, uh, some of those statistics a report or two ago were actually going backwards. Mm. So rather than closing the gap, the gap was actually widening. was widening. Mm. And I believe from this most recent report that was done on the targets, the, you know, the word failed miserably was kind of uh, bandied about. So, you know, I think supporting... Uh, one of the things to understand about closing the gap is that that has come from Indigenous communities who are like, we have solutions, mm. but we need support. And also, we, if you're going to say that we're citizens of your country then it is our human right to receive the appropriate services to be able to live safe and healthy lives. So, you know, part of that is about holding government accountable in that regard and supporting that. But, you know, for non-Indigenous people, the most important thing, I think, is to listen to Indigenous people. There is a real history of not listening to Indigenous people and be like, you know, governments going, oh, I've got this really great idea and we're going to do this blanket rollout of this, you know, particular initiative and it not working because they haven't listened to the people in that community. So I think listening first and foremost, but secondly, supporting those, you know, as much as we've spoken just because of the nature of this about disadvantage, there is so much resistance and there is so much positivity in Indigenous communities that, you know, for me as a black fella, I'm incredibly proud of. And supporting those organisations is incredibly important. You know, um, we have warriors of the Aboriginal resistance in Melbourne who shut down streets with their protests every year. We have grandmothers against removals. Uh, they should be supported. So one of the things about the stolen generation and uh, that thing about kind of the past and the present combining and also about those institutions is that the rates of Indigenous children being removed from their families, even though we no longer have the stolen generation, is actually higher than... It, the rate oh, of that okay. is higher than it was during... Uh, that period of time. So Grandmothers Against Removals is about pushing back on that and saying, we have healthy families. Mm -hmm. Don't take our kids. We will take care of them in our kinship system. So supporting organisations... 
<laughs> so supporting organisations like that is important. Like a lot of people talk about um, writing letters to your MP and things like that. Like we want to hear more voices, so should we also be writing to radio stations and writing to TV networks and saying, I want to hear more voices and see more people as well? Is that... Yeah, I think that that's helpful, definitely, because there are lots and lots of extremely intelligent and active Indigenous people that don't get heard mm. because mainstream media aren't interested. So, yeah, definitely. Um, grandmothers Against Removals, is there a place that we can donate to? I think this is a very good one for us to get behind because it's specifically a female one. Yeah. So if you've got $1, $5, $10, $10,000 whatever it is that you've got that you can give, if everyone could give them something this week, there would just be like a boost and a morale boost and like, oh, what's all this coming in and with this, this Twitter action? If anyone wants to volunteer or get involved and could write to them and say, hey, I would help out if there was anything you wanted me to do, you have to be careful, I think, if you're white of kind of imposing your white saviorism, but there may be something that is useful for you to do to contribute. And so I feel like if we could support this group together even just for the next two weeks, if everyone gave them an injection of something, and then some people in this room will get more involved in that and will say, actually, that's what I'm going to do for my charity at work, or that start to read more about it, start to connect in more. Because um, often you think, oh, how can I get involved, or as a white person, should I? Um, but this is the kind of solidarity and support by listening to somebody who is indigenous and is saying, yes, that would actually be very helpful that we can do. Are we on board for that? Yes. <laughs> Is there anything else that you came here to say, Eugenia, that you feel we should know, that you would like to leave on the table, There's something you haven't said? Well, sorry, can I be really cheeky and add in two more groups that yes. I Yes. Um, there, there is a group in Victoria called JIRA, D-J-I-R-R-A, um, which people are familiar with. And JIRA work uh, with Aboriginal women around legal issues and particularly issues related to uh, family and domestic violence. So they're a really important organisation to support. And also recently Warriors of the Aboriginal Resistance and other people in the community have been starting a pay the rent campaign. And I think that that's also important to Wonderful. support. I believe on the war page you should be able to find information about that. Whose rent are we paying? Can you unpack that a bit more for our global listeners? Sure. So mm. Pay the Rent is a campaign for justice. It's a campaign that directly speaks to the theft of land. Right. So when you were doing your acknowledgement of country before, the wording that you used is about Indigenous people not ceding their sovereignty. And so therefore, this country was invaded and land was stolen from Aboriginal people. So pay the rent is about saying, well, you're essentially squatters, so it's time to pay the rent. And right. then... Okay. Um, Go on for that. And for the sake of transparency, mm -hmm. um, that uh, funds that are being donated to that, there are community meetings that are happening very soon to determine where they're going to direct those funds that might go towards a range of different kind of social and community uh, initiatives. Great. So if you live with an, a sort of an outstanding amount of white guilt, set up a direct debit. Yes, Because that's perfect. sort of... I mean, it's not unuseful, is it, to just go, well, there's, you know, even if it's like $5, you know, a week or a month or, you know, whatever you can afford, if you can afford anything... If you can afford, if you could afford $5 a month, I think that would be, it's sort of like, and you just put it on your computer, on your spreadsheet as white guilt. Oh, yeah. Sort of like, you know. <laughs> Listen, if you can afford $50 or $200, some people here will have very good jobs. There are some nice handbags here, I've seen them. And, <laughs> you know, imagine how slightly less white guilty you would feel. And just go, just, you know, sometimes it's really good to do that kind of thing. And don't tell anyone. Just do it and see what that feels like. I think it's a really good exercise. You have yeah. been absolutely brilliant. Uh, thank you. Thank you so, so much, Eugenia Flynn. I just want to 
check, does anyone have a question for Eugenia? Has anyone got anything that they would like to ask? Okay, what would you say to someone who says that you shouldn't change the date of Australia Day? That's a good question. Um, look, there, there are diff varying thoughts about the date of Australia Day. I think that there are people who believe in incremental change. I'm sorry, this is going to be really complex. There are people who believe in incremental change, right? Like that you can chip away at things. And so lots of those people are like, we should change the date and therefore we can come together on another day. Um, there are other people who are anti-nationalist or who believe that with the status of the way that things are, there's not really anything to celebrate, so we should abolish Australia Day. So I, I just wanted to be clear that there are sort of different thoughts about that. Um, if people are pushing back on changing the date, oh, God, I try not to interact with those people. <laughs> so I don't really... Um, talk to them. But I mean, I think that that's also a protection thing and I understand that the most important thing for white people to do is to talk to other white people about mm -hmm. these kinds of issues. So I am trying to think of what you would say <laughs> um, if someone was like, you know, don't change the day. I mean, I, I think that one of the things that you can do is explain that it holds this country in a state of infancy. So to not acknowledge and to be celebrating a day where uh, the country was invaded and terrible things happen really just holds us all in this state of stasis. Mm. And so in order to kind of move forward and, you know, for people who are uh, all about changing the date and wanting to celebrate, you know, it's, I think it's important to say that Australia is a great country and if you love it, you should want to see it be better. So that might be a nice way to kind of mm. win people over. Yeah. Thank you, that's a lovely answer. That's a really lovely answer. Do you have anything to plug, Geraldine? Oh, um, tickets for my new show are on sale. Thank you. Um, I'd love to see you all there. Uh, it's called What a Surprise, and it's on at the Comedy Festival. Mm. As is Jessica Foster Q's Hench, uh, which, if you are a feminist, and you miss it, you're not a feminist. Mm -hmm. um, and also, apparently, uh, Rosie Jones. Do you know Rosie Jones? She yes. Yes. She's on it doing backwards. She's such a funny woman. Mm. Uh, Josie Long, Flo and Joan, Sarah Keyworth, Eleanor Tiernan, uh, Lou Sanders. There's so many amazing women coming over. So check them out. Especially, can you check out Rosie Jones and Jessica Foster Q and give them a big hug from me? Will do. And on Twitter, I'm at Deborah FW. Can we follow you? Because we need to be reading everything you're writing. Where are you? Uh, <laughs> uh, Do you want us following you or not really? You're like, no. I'm getting out of this building and I don't want to see any of these people ever again. Sure. Uh, buy the book? Yes, yes, you can buy the Me Too book. It's a great anthology with lots and lots of amazing people. Hashtag Me Too it. stories from the Australian yep. movement. Please buy it from a bookshop who pays their taxes. Yep. I mostly just post pictures of food on my Instagram. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. But it's, you're doing PhD, yeah? I am doing my PhD. Yeah. yeah. So, when, so when that's done, you're going to be Dr. Eugenia Flynn? Yeah, that's and, the idea. And there'll be a thesis, probably a book from that. So we must watch out for you and follow you. Are you on Twitter? Yes, at Flying Genie, number one. <laughs> at Flying Genie, number one. Uh, give Jeannie a follow, and uh, I'm sure she'll be pointing you towards all sorts of interesting things, both feminist things that you need to know about, intersecting that with indigenous issues you need to know about, intersecting that with food, which you need to know about. <laughs> yeah. Put your hands together and make incredible woohooing noises for the wonderful Grace Petrie! <laughs> No, actually, I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a socialist left-wing protest singer, uh, and I've been singing songs uh, for about 10 years um, with the aim of trying to make the world a better place. Um, thank you, yeah, th and I think we, thanks. Yeah, 
And I think, and I think we can all agree I've been fucking unsuccessful so far, haven't I? Bloody hell. So I think, if anything, I'm, I'm making things worse. I think. Banter worse. But um, I wrote this song uh, about Donald Trump uh, getting elected. Um, but uh, yeah, I know, I really, I've come to fucking cheer you up, guys, haven't I, Melbourne? Um, but it's all right. It's kind of a hopeful song, I hope, anyway. Um, and it's about what I think we all need to be doing in this world, which is uh, working to make it a better place and to tear down the walls between people and to build bridges where they need to be bridges built. It's called You Build a Wall, Gazis. It's hard to keep aflame, but tomorrow's ours to claim. Sometimes a battle cry sounds like a lullaby, and tonight I think we need them both the same. To everyone who's scared of what they see, every time they turn on their TV, to anyone who's listening to me, for every single kid I used to. You build a wall, and we'll build a ladder. Your falling leaves, dead from the branch, and you'll see how much a snowflake matters when we become an avalanche. You build a wall, and we'll just get higher. You don't learn to fight from privilege. Hide in the dark, and we'll light a fire. You build a We'll build a bridge, we'll build a bridge. I've been your palaces of gold, your days already growing old. For all the ways you tried to conquer and divide, your ruin will be all the lies you told. Because compassion lives in every single land. We are made of something you don't understand Stronger than the weapons in your hand And bigger than those armies you command You build a wall And we'll build a ladder Your falling leaves Dead from the branch And you'll see how much a snowflake matters when we become an avalanche You build a wall, we'll just get higher You don't learn to fight from privilege Hide in the dark and we'll light a fire You build a wall, we'll build a bridge We'll build a bridge turn on their TV to anyone who's listening to me and for every single kid I used to be they'll build a wall and we'll build a ladder their falling leaves dead from the branch and they'll see how much a snowflake matters when we become an avalanche You build a wall, we'll just get higher You don't learn to fight from privilege Hide in the dark and we'll light a fire You build a wall, we'll build a bridge You build a wall, we'll build a bridge Can you do that bit, Melbourne? You build a wall We'll build a bridge, you build a wall, 
We'll build a bridge. You build a wall. We'll build a bridge. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Geraldine Hickey, and our very special guest, Eugenia Flynn. Live music from Grace Petrie, The Guilty Feminist theme tune by Mark Hodge, and produced by Nick Sheldon. The producers were Tom Selitsky for The Spontaneity Shop, Jeff Ring for Australian Comedy Management. Thanks to everyone at the Thornbury Theatre, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit GuiltyFeminist.com. like to ask Geraldine Hickey if there are any other names of lesbian sexual positions that I don't know. Oh. What are the names? Well, there's the, um, the old, there's the old peg in the basket. Peg in the basket? Yeah. I'm... Have you made that up? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> See? Because we can all imagine what it is, though. <laughs> what? Tell Nothing. us. Nothing. <laughs> A huge thank you to our amazing patrons who have supported this podcast at the Smash the Patriarchy level or above. Sarah Belcher, Valerie Marr, John Quokoy, Sarah Brown, Sarah Boom, and Ruby Rose Thompson.